All right, uh, we are gonna go right into our next talk. Um, so our next speaker uh, is Tom Wilkie, who I somehow convinced to speak at this event. Uh, Tom and I hung out uh, at KubeCon uh, in the beginning of December and talked a lot about Prometheus stuff. Uh, so Tom is very well known for his contributions to Prometheus uh, and he was at WeWorks uh, until recently and now he has started his own company based on a lot of the work that he's been doing. So welcome Tom to the stage. Is this working? Yep, good. Hello everyone. Thank you for having me, Paul. Uh, thanks for the invite. And uh, yes, here to talk about Prometheus, which should be interesting at an influx conference. But I think like actually the, the talk's a bit more general about monitoring patterns. So hopefully everything's very transferable. So yes, I'm here to talk about the RED method. Before we get started, have any of you actually used Prometheus? Are there any Prometheus users in the room? Controversial question. <laughs> Just the one, okay. And uh, most of the examples in my talk are gonna be using Prometheus, obviously, um, but hopefully they're quite transferable into uh, the new influx query language as well. We're also gonna be running on our Kubernetes cluster. So any Kubernetes users here? Oh wow, normally when I give these talks, it's like, you know, 50-50 for both those questions. Interesting. So, uh, Paul gave a bit of an introduction. I've started a company called Causal with a friend of mine called David. Um, we're transforming observability, sorry about that. Um, I'm also a Prometheus developer and a homebrewer, and more recently a 3D printer uh, person, if you uh, follow my Twitter feed. I did work on Kubernetes and uh, an open source project called Cortex, which is a horizontally scalable version of Prometheus, very similar to some of the techniques um, the previous speaker was talking about. At Weaveworks, previously at Google, a uh, very long time ago, I had my own startup called Akunu, which um, if anyone speaks French, you'll find very amusing. So, brief overview. Why does any of this matter? We're actually gonna not talk about the red method immediately. We're gonna talk about the use method, which is what kind of inspired this. And then we're gonna go into uh, the four golden signals, which also inspired this work. So why does this matter? Well, there was a Prometheus talk, uh, Prometheus conference in Munich in August last year, and people kept referencing this thing called the red method. And similarly, like if any of you went to Monitorama, um, I didn't go, but I saw some of the videos. Uh, this red method thing was, was referenced a few times and, and no one has actually kind of sat down and told everyone what it is. And so I kind of came up with it, um, or at least gave it its name uh, quite a long time ago, about two and a half years ago, and I felt like I should really give the canonical talk of what I meant when I said the red method. Um, so this is, I think, the fourth or fifth time I've now given this talk, so hopefully I should know what I'm talking about now. But before we get into that, I'm gonna talk about the use method. So the use method is by a chap called Brendan Gregg, Who's, uh, who's very famous for his work on, on monitoring and, and has an absolutely fantastic blog and website. Um, I think he works for Netflix, but I could be wrong. Anyway, the use method basically says, for every resource in your system, look at the utilization, the saturation, and the error rate. So this means utilization's got a quite a nice definition, the percent of time that resource is busy. So you can think of that as uh, the percent of time the disk spent doing I.O. or the, spent the percent of time the processor was actually executing a process. Um, saturation, this is maybe a little bit harder to define for some, some different resources, um, the amount of work the resource has to do. So typically, if you're looking at the CPU, this would be the load average, the number of waiting tasks on the, on the, on the queue. Um, hard, you know, easy to do for, again, for a disk, the number of pending IOs. Harder to do for something like memory, perhaps. So the nice thing about having this kind of pattern is it turns the potentially kind of uh, guesswork task of trying to figure out why things are slow or why things are misbehaving into kind of a much more methodolo uh, methodological, oh, I don't know, can't say that word, and much more kind of unknown unknowns into known unknowns. So you can go through this kind of tick box exercise, check your CPU, check your memory usage, check your disk, check your network, and eventually you'll hit something that doesn't look quite right. Um, so this really is about hunting for problems. It becomes methodological, there you go, and tractable. Um, so some examples of how you do this in, Promethe in Prometheus. Um, there's gonna be a few PromQL queries here, so I'm gonna actually run them through you because I guess you don't really know what PromQL looks like. It's very similar, I guess, to the new Prometheus query language. You've got the things inside the curly brackets are called label selectors. So we're basically saying where it says node CPU, job equals node explore, so mode equals idle. You're basically looking at key value pairs. So all the time series where job equals node, uh, node exporter, 
intersected with all the time series where mode equals idle, intersected with all the time series where main equals node CPU. So that is going to return you a massive set of time series. From that set, we then take the square brackets and put one M on it, which basically says, take me one minute moving windows over that set. And then we rate that. And the reason we rate it, I think this is similar in, in Flux, I'm not sure. Um, in Prometheus, we only deal with counters with increasing value. Um, so really, node CPU is going to give you the number of seconds the CPU has spent in idle state. And it's only ever increasing. So the rate is giving you that differentiation, which is giving you that number of seconds per second, which is giving you the utilization. And then we average and one minus it, and that's just a neat trick to give the kind of total CPU utilization of your entire cluster, dealing with the fact that some machines have different numbers of cores and so on. Saturation is a little bit more simple. One of the tricks I like to do when I'm doing saturation is I like to divide by the total or what should be the total so that my saturations are always kind of as a, as a, like a percentage, like one is completely saturated. This means I don't really have to know the units of the particular resource I'm looking at when I'm kind of debugging this and, and going through instant response. So you'll notice for CPU, I haven't really got an error uh, metric. Um, and it's kind of interesting what does, what does errors mean. I, I, I've asked a few people, we've talked about doing things like grepping D message for you know, machine check exceptions and things like this. But actually, like if, if like me, you're running on a virtualized system, you generally don't see this. Your VM just disappears if you have an actual CPU error. Uh, memory gets a little bit more interesting, a little more difficult, because counting your amount of used memory in Linux is, is non-trivial. Um, this is the one we've come up with. Um, saturation, this is a little bit more interesting because how do you tell what your memory saturation is? The suggestion from Brendan Gregg is to look at your paging rate um, as amount of paging your system's doing as a kind of indication that it might be oversaturated when it comes to memory. Not particularly happy about that one. I'm not going to go through any more of these queries because this gets very, very interesting, very boring, sorry. Um, and I'm just going to talk about like there are some hard cases. We already talked about CPU errors. Memory errors are another interesting case. Linux, it turns out, is really bad at exposing error counts. Um, so all of, these, all of this information I'm talking about is scraped out of the kernel. And it's really bad at exposing I.O. errors, for instance. A lot of these things will only ever appear in D message. Um, yeah. And then a lot of really tricky, one of the companies I work with um, has some tricky performance problems that really come down to memory bandwidth. Um, you know, their CPUs are sitting mostly idle, their memory is mostly idle, the disks are mostly idle, but the process is not, it's not going as quickly as they think it should be. And this is because they've saturated their memory bandwidth. They're doing like real-time video processing. Um, so getting good stats for interconnects is quite challenging. There's a, a project from Intel called Snap, which has some really interesting metrics coming out of that that I want to kind of investigate a bit more and, and add to this talk. So let's do a quick demo. So one of the things uh, I also wanted to bring to the table here is I've seen multiple people go through this process of writing down all these queries and make various common mistakes. Uh, the most uh, typical one, the Docker memory stat includes cached memory. So a lot of people will get confused when their Docker uh, containers are using way more memory than like Top tells them um, and things like that. So I wanted to produce like a canonical set of dashboards um, and queries for the use method. And in particular, the use method with Prometheus running on Kubernetes. And of course, this needed a name. So I'm going to show you the project and then show you the outcome. Uh, if I just mirror my display. Yes, here we go. So the project is on our GitHub. We only have two repositories. We have a public and a private repository. This is the Googler in me who likes mini, uh, who likes uh, mono repos. But in our, uh, in our public mono repo, there's a project called Clumps. And Clumps stands for Kubernetes Linux Use Method with Prometheus. If anyone can think of a better name, then that would be very welcome. Anyway, so here's, here's the canonical set of dashboards we've published. Um, so this is looking at cluster-wide uh, use method ma metrics, basically, a row per resource, and then utilization and saturation. And we don't really have decent error rates for many things. And this is on our dev cluster. Yeah, there you go. So if you wanted uh, some use method dashboards, help yourself. One of the other really kind of more interesting things that came out of this was actually when looking, well, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute, but I'm in the latter part of this talk. So that's clumps and the use method. Let me just get this guy. Right, 
right there. For references on this, Brendan Gregg's uh, website is really the main reference. Um, the slides are online, so they're all clickable links. Um, I'll tweet them afterwards. Um, now onto the red method, the actual title of the talk. So, the story behind this was, um, I was at a company called Weaveworks. We were launching a, a hosted visualization system called Weavescope. Um, and I'd built the, the cloud backend for Weavescope. And an, a new chap joined the company and asked us what our monitoring philosophy for our cloud instance was. And I had no idea what he was talking about. Um, he suggested we use the use method. And I would spent a couple of years at Google. And Google didn't do it like that for kind of real-time QPS serving systems. They didn't do the use method. You know, they had that for other things. But what I really wanted to monitor was kind of request-oriented metrics. And so I thought, well, what we really need to argue with this new person who's joined is a catchy name for the request-oriented metrics. And I think this was just before the, the Google SRE book came out. And so I invented one. I called it the red method. And so the red method means for every service or microservice, monitor your request rate. That's the number of requests a second. Your request errors, so number of failing requests a second, and the request duration. And as you can tell, this is slightly tortuous because I've had to pick things that make a nice acronym. Um, so I did a bit of uh, archaeology. Uh, the first mention of this was uh, in December 2015. Well, first time I mentioned it, at least. Um, and you'll probably, if anyone's familiar with Google's four golden signals, you'll remember that there's a fourth signal, which is saturation. And the reason I didn't include that in the red method is because I forgot about it. So, so why, why is this a good thing? Why am I here talking about this? Well, having the same or similar metrics exposed by every service in your microservice architecture, if, you, if you're running a service, that is, right, then this gives you the ability to put people on call who didn't write those services. So when I was at Google, I used to be on call for Google Analytics. It's quite a big service that Google runs. You might have heard of it. Um, now, I didn't write any of the Google Analytics services, but I was still able to be on call for them because for me, they were little black boxes. You know, I just had to, when, when something went wrong, I had to traverse my little graph of all the services, figure out which one was throwing the errors, and then go and look at the logs, file a bug with the developers, resize it, whatever, you know, restart it. So this give, giving this kind of consistency across services really helps like reducing the cognitive load of your on-call people. It really helps them be on call for more services, be on call for services they didn't write themselves, and it allows you basically to just scale kind of the on-call function of your, of your development team. It also aligns very closely with your SLAs. So really, you should care about your customers and not your computers. And this is kind of my criticism, I guess, of the use method is it cares a lot about your hardware and your computers and are they happy and not so much about are your customers happy. So the red method is really kind of looking at are my customers happy, are the requests they're sending to my service succeeding and are they returning in a reasonable amount of time. So this kind of really, you know, we, we page on these three metrics. We, we page on error rate going to zero because normally that means something's broken. On, sorry, request rate going to zero. Error rate going above, I think, 0.1% and duration going above about 100 milliseconds, I think, for most of our services. And, and this, this, cause, this, this is our monitoring philosophy, it's our alerting philosophy, it's our on-call philosophy, and it kind of works, for us at least. Yeah, first time I mentioned it, I had a slightly different haircut. Um, this kind of caused a bit of a storm on Twitter, and I don't think Brendan Gregg's talking to me, but like, I just wanted to say, like, uh, the use method is really good, and it inspired this, and we do that as well. Um, but I just wanted to highlight the differences. So how do you do the red method in Prometheus? and go. Luckily, it fits on almost one slide. So I think this is similar with Influx. You have to pre-declare the metric. So here we're saying, import the Prometheus client library, declare a metric we're calling request duration seconds, and we're giving it the default buckets, and I'll explain that in a minute. And then this type of this metric is a histogram. So this is going to export the time each request took. But in Prometheus, a histogram also exports the number of requests, which we can differentiate and get the rate. And because I've broken this metric down by status, I can also work out the error rate just from the single exported metric. Um, now, the buckets are interesting because the way Prometheus exports uh, request duration, or any duration, in fact, is as, a, is as a histogram. So effectively, there's a series of buckets. You know, it'd be all requests that finished in less than one millisecond, all requests that finished in less than 10, less than 100, less than a second, and so on. And then from that, Prometheus provides you with functions to work out 
what, you know, what is the expected uh, latency at the 96 percentile principle. I'll show you those in a minute. So that's kind of the declaration. Now, if you wanted to instrument your actual code, I've done it for a HTTP server, I prefer the middleware approach. So you define a little function which takes a HTTP handler, returns you a HTTP handler, measures some stuff about that HTTP handler, um, and then you just have to, in the bottom, you see you just have to wrap your actual HTTP handlers. If you're doing this with gRPC, there's some excellent libraries available that do this all for you, or you can roll your own, or you can use mine. Um, don't forget to expose the metrics from Prometheus. Prometheus works with a pool-based model, so your services have to expose a slash metrics HTTP handler. And Prometheus will discover those services, come along and scrape the metrics out of it. And we can get into arguments about push versus pull later. So once you've gone through all of that, how do you actually do the red method? Well, luckily this fits on a single slide. Last, last PromQL queries, I promise. Um, first, the rate of request is super easy. So we said the metric was called request duration seconds. Well, that's kind of a bit of syntactic sugar. In Prometheus, we will just append underscore count and underscore sum to the bottom of that. So the differential of request duration seconds count, this ever-increasing counter, is the request rate. So this is a one-minute moving request rate for whatever job you want. For error rate, basically the same thing. This is the actual rate of uh, errors as an absolute number. I like to divide that by the request rate, so I get it as a percentage. And here you can see we've applied a an extra filter that basically said, please return me all the request duration second count time series where the status code doesn't match the regular expression to dot dot. So this is assuming HTTP-like uh, error codes. And then finally, the duration, as I was explaining before, use a histogram quantile function. I've said the 99th percentile. And one of the things everyone always forgets is to put a rate in the request duration seconds bucket in their duration, in their histogram. That's at least what I forgot for about a year and all my histograms are wrong. But yeah, so um, that query will give it, I don't really have time to explain it in any more detail. So a quick demo. Oh, well you've seen it, I don't, yeah, I'm running short on time. So I won't do a demo of that, I'll do a demo of the stuff later. So I touched earlier on this kind of tree or graph of microservices approach, and this has become very popular and, and it's very trendy. Um, I'm not a huge proponent of microservices, I think our company has four services internally. I um, mean, I like to have some differentiation between services. I like the previous discussion about separating out the query path from the ingest path, because that's exactly what we do. And I think it's super important. We, uh, we were hosting the dashboards for FOSDEM in Brussels uh, two weekends ago, and we absolutely got hugged to death um, by all the users, thousands of people wanting to view the FOSDEM dashboards for the Wi-Fi and the number of sweaters they'd sold and so on. Um, and having a separate query path to a write path allowed us to scale that up and add more caching and add more resources and try and keep up with the, uh, the friendly requests. Anyway, if you've got this uh, graph of services, I like the approach of um, walking that graph uh, breadth first to try and f to, to render out your dashboards, basically. So we would sit at the top, you know, we s all the traffic comes into our front ends, and then the next level down, they would the writes will go to a distributor, and the next level down, the, the writes would go to what's called an ingester. So the distributor is the thing that, for, that does the consistent hash for us, and so on and so on. So we kind of walk through that tree and draw a line, uh, a, a row per service in Grafana. And then on the left, we put QPS. And well, there, there, there aren't any errors in that uh, graph, but we also put the number of errors in the same graph. And on the, the right, we do latency. And what is our latency? Well, I'm going to say this is our dev cluster, because our latency is a little bit high on that one. Um, and that's how we do all of our dashboards for this kind of red method style. And this is why, again, I kind of like the red method because it encourages you to come to some sort of consistency of your monitoring. So if I was to walk into random company X, you were to hire me on day one, and you'd done your graphs in this, then it would probably only take me days or weeks to become on call capable for you. Um, and you know, for most developers, they don't really want to spend a huge amount of time thinking about how to instrument and monitor their services because they've got more important jobs to do. So here's this kind of pattern for how you should do it. Um, there's a company called Vivid Cortex, who I've never actually met, but they've kind of taken this approach and, and done a series of blog posts and called it hierarchical observability, which I kind of like. I think it's great. So last thing we've got is for the latency graphs on the side, this is me zoomed in on one. I've obviously, I'm plotting the 99th percentile and the 50th percentile, but I also plot the average. Now, you'll see a lot of people advising you never to look at the average latency of your services because it's massively misleading. What does average mean? 
um, kind of means the expected, but it, it doesn't really give you uh, any kind of uh, intuition as to like, is this a big problem? A large average could just be one massive outlier or it could be everyone. So you shouldn't look at your averages except for, I advise people to put their averages on for two reasons. One, I refer to this bucket implementation for histograms before. If you get the buckets wrong, your histograms might massively underestimate your latency. And so by putting the average on there, which won't be underestimated, and by plotting the 50th percentile on there, if they're like miles apart, there's something wrong. If they're really close together, it's kind of working, and they're close together too. The second reason I like to put averages on these graphs is because averages sum nicely. If you have a service that's sitting there, talks to one service, then talks to another service, and you see a high average latency on the, the parent service, then it should really be the sum of the two latencies on the ch ch child services. The same isn't true for percentiles, unfortunately. So averages kind of help you identify which services suffer in, in an incident perhaps. Right then, there's lots of things to read about this red method. There's, there's the original stuff that I wrote. Um, the stuff by Cindy is really good. If people aren't familiar with her, I really like her writing style. She's been on a really big Twitter rant recently about on call, and I absolutely agree with everything she says. Um, Peter also writes some good stuff about uh, instrumentation and logging and observability, um, so I'd recommend reading those. And, uh, and the Vivid Cortex stuff I talked about earlier. These will all be online and they're, li they're linked later. So in the final few minutes, the four golden signals. This is Google's monitoring philosophy. It's public now. They published a book about it, so I can talk about it. Um, it isn't a little sticker that you stick on your mobile phone to get better reception, which is what happened for a while if you Googled it. So what they talk about is the four golden signals are latency, very similar to the duration, bit of red. Uh, traffic, very, very similar to the request, bit of red. Error rate, which is literally identical. And saturation, which they define as how full your services are. Yeah, how full your services are. That's a bit, uh, bit of a weird definition. I guess, I mean, I know inside Google you do load testing and you know kind of how many CPU cycles it should take to serve a given request and then you can look at your provisioning and you can say, oh, well, my request is so full. I'm sorry, my service is so full based on kind of your load testing you've done and so on. But in the real world, that's kind of particularly mature, particularly advanced, and I don't, I don't do that. Um, but luckily, if you're running on Kubernetes, there is a way of doing that, or at least getting a kind of approximation for saturation. So in the last remaining minutes, I will see if this works. Now, there is a bunch of recording rules, which are kind of like uh, pre-recorded queries in Prometheus that are defined in clumps. And one of them is the amount of CPU we've uh, allocated to each job in our system. And that would be resource request memory, resource request memory, this one here. So if we take this and we bung it in here, it gives us, yes, good, we've created a table. So we can see that in prod, we've only given our ingesters six CPUs in prod, that seems a bit low. Anyway, the next thing we can do is we can take the resource usage in terms of CPU, so that'd be this one, and we can divide one by the other, and we get no data points. Yes, this is what happened last time. Okay, just give me a second. If it worked, then it wouldn't be a real demo. Um, this is how you know I'm actually typing this in and it's not screen recording. So this is probably wrong. This should be cube for CPU advisor. That's the other cube. Yeah. And uh, this one is wrong. This should be cube system. Actually, it doesn't matter. It's the only job that exports that. I have to leave that. Yes, OK, that's worked. Good. And then we can divide it by this one. I'm not going to walk you through these queries. Come and find me later if you're really interested. Um, it's getting to somewhat advanced Prometheus here. It's all open source, you can just go and look at it yourself. Right, and there we go. So this is now giving us the kind of um, percent utilization of the CPU of our services. So the saturation of the, s the services CPU, if you like. Um, Ingester is 73% saturated, so I should probably increase that. Six is a bit low. Anyway, that is how you do saturation on a Kubernetes cluster with Prometheus. So uh, to read about this, the Google SRE book, 
is open source, well, is freely available at least on that, on that web, uh, website. And uh, this is also what you get if you Google for golden signals, which is just another blog post. Interestingly, like, and I think it's just because the name is not catchy enough, which is kind of embarrassing. Um, the four golden signals doesn't seem to be talked about that much, and it is really the canonical source of the red method. Um, so you should read this. It's much better written than, than the stuff I've wrote. So in summary, oh, I'm on a mirrored mode. In summary, use method for your infrastructure. Use method for your infrastructure. Also really helpful when doing performance debugging. Um, the red method for your services and for your SLAs and for your dashboards and for you know caring about your customers. And if you get really advanced and you start provisioning the actual CPU usage, like if you're running on a GKE cluster and it, it kind of becomes necessary, you can start doing things like saturation. And yes, naming things is hard. The four golden signals should be more popular. Okay, I hopefully have left some time for questions. Thank you very much. a really good sign, or you're all just really hungry. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Tom. It's There are no questions because you explained everything so well that everybody has, uh, yeah, everybody has all the answers now. So we can all just relax. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you.